Amen. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, he's talking about how that we have got to respond to be respond to the word of truth as doers of the word and not hearers only. As he says in verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And we talked about how it does no good to listen to preaching, teaching, read the Bible, hear the Bible read. It does no good if we don't do what it says. It only benefits us. We only partake of the blessings that are found therein when we do what it says. And so the the blessing is found in the doing of God's Word. And he talked about the man looking at his face in the mirror. uh, And verse 23, If anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doings. See, the blessing comes in the doing of God's will. Not the hearing, not the believing, but the hearing, believing, and doing. There's where the blessing comes in. It's like a combination to a combination lock. If you don't have the doing part of it, you're not going to unlock the lock. You can hear, you can believe it, but until you turn that dial to doing, obedience, you're not going to unlock those blessings that God has for His people. And He likens God's will to uh, that mirror that you look at. You know, I, I looked in the mirror this morning, I fixed my hair, I got my tie straight, I made myself look beautiful to come up here and to worship. And we, we all looked in the mirror. But what good would it do if you wake up in the morning, if you have more hair than I do, and your hair is disheveled, you look in the mirror intently, as he says there, that's what the Greek is actually saying, you look in the mirror intently to see a problem. Now, have you seen these, these women know what I'm talking about, these magnifying mirrors that make your face look really big and it shows details? Do you just do that to look at yourself and walk away and make no changes? No, you look at yourself intently to see what changes do I need to make in my face or in my hair. That's the point of looking in the mirror. You know, it's not like happy days, the fawn's going to comb his hair in the mirror and he looks at himself and says, hey, there's no improvement, you know. He's satisfied with what he sees and he walks away because he's so cool. No, we look into the perfect law of liberty, the Bible, and we see the the changes we've got to make. You know, there are some people who only want to look at the Bible in a devotional sense. They only want to look at it for the sense of the positive. They don't want any kind of negative scripture, anything that talks about hell. And and that's, that's the kind of society and the kind of religions that you'll find in the world. But you know the one who spoke more about hell than anyone in the Bible was Jesus. He spoke more about hell than he did heaven. He wants us to look in the mirror and make changes. And we look into the mirror to see what problems we face. And it shows us for what we are, not what we want to look like. The mirror shows us for what we really look like. And that's what the Bible does. It's a mirror of the soul and it shows us for what we really are, our flaws that we have that we need to improve upon. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, God's word is a law. In Isaiah chapter 2, when it talks about, it prophesies of the establishment of the church, it talks about the law of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. The gospel is law despite what those in in the church even say. It is a law. It's not like the law of Moses, but it is a law. It's a law of liberty. And what does it liberate us from? Sin. It's not a law that says you can do whatever you want to do. That's what some people interpret that as. It's a law that liberates us from sin so we can be obedient to the will of God. 
So it's a law of freedom. It sets us free. Those who do not submit to the will of God, who look at us as being in bondage to thou shalt not do this, that, or the other, they are the ones who are in bondage. We are free when we do what God says. We're free from guilt. We're free from sin. We're uh, ones who have unleashed the blessings that are found because we're doers of the word and not hearers only. Verse 26 and 27, he says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world or unspotted from the world. This is where you find in the New Testament where God calls the church a religion. Religion that is pure and undefiled. There's a, a popular trend in our, in our society to, to, to say no to religion, but yes to Jesus. Biblically, you can't do that. And what they mean by that, say, say no to the church and yes to Jesus. They say those cute little phrases and they might put them on their t-shirts, but it's not biblical. And the, the, the very popular thing to say nowadays is, it's not a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus. But biblically, it is a religion based upon a relationship with Jesus. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus without pure and undefiled religion. And pure and undefiled religion is based upon a relationship with Jesus. So they're not antagonistic to one another. God here through James says this is pure and undefiled religion. Here is what it is. So religion is not a, uh, a bad word. Um, there was even one denomination here in Roy City that was advertising as uh, not religious. There was a church that said that they were not religious. They were not, I forgot the exact wording, but they actually said, not a religion, but a church, da-da-da-da-da-da. So they were claiming to be a non-religious church. Well, biblically, that's impossible. That's, I mean, that, that's something that does not happen according to the Bible. But he says here in verse 26, there has to be, a, a, and this goes along with the whole doing God's will. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, and in chapter 3, he's going to talk more about this. The danger of the tongue, how the tongue is a small member but can do so much damage or it can do so much good. If you don't control your tongue, if you don't control your speech, you deceive your heart, your religion is worthless. If you have bad speech, and if you have a tongue that does not speak what it ought to speak, you have a, a worthless religion or a vain religion, some translations say. Vain means useless or worthless. And so there is that bridle or that controlling of the tongue. You put a bridle in a horse to control that huge animal, that small amount of uh, a bridle controls that huge, very powerful animal. So there is a controlling factor there. And in chapter 3, we're going to go into more detail about that, about the controlling of the tongue. But um, that goes hand in hand with having your religion being what it should be in the sight of God. And in verse 27, he says, The religion that is pure and undefiled. So there is a pure and undefiled religion before God the Father. To say otherwise is to contradict plain passages of the scripture you cannot have a church that is not a religion and i would agree that these churches that claim to not be a religion they're not the religion of christ i would agree with that they're not the religion of christ they're man-made but the religion that is pure and undefiled before god and that also tells me in verse 27 that there can be religion that is impure and defiled Religion that is contaminated. But the pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, number one, 
and to keep oneself unspotted or unstained from the world. These are, are two things here uh, that uh, go together, and they're a, a broad spectrum of activity. We see here, number one, to visit the orphans and the widows and their affliction. That word visit there <clears throat> is the word in the Greek for going to see so that you can see what their needs are to take care of their needs. It's not just the way we use the word visit to go by and see how they're doing for 10 minutes and then leave. That's not what that word visit means. It means to go and to see and to take care of their needs. And, and that's exactly what it, it means. Uh, and we find uh, throughout the Bible, I forgot one of my pieces of paper here had notes on it. Throughout the Bible, God <clears throat> has been concerned um, about those who are less fortunate um, that the people of God are to take care of them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. <clears throat> Both Old and New Testament make it very clear that God wants His people to take care of orphans and widows and those who are less fortunate. <clears throat> Talking about God, he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Isaiah chapter 1, the prophet Isaiah chapter 1. We see here that God through Isaiah is condemning uh, the people for not having compassion and, tell, and tells them that if you want to be right with me, here's what you got to do. Isaiah chapter 1, um, verse 16 says, Wash your hands, make yourself clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil. That's repentance, verse 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. So again, Old and New Testament make it very clear that God wants the, the orphans and the widows uh, taken care of. He wants them to be looked after. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16 talks about helping those widows and the categories of those who are widows that should be uh, put on the list of those who need help from the church. So you see that this is something that God has wanted for His people, both in the Old and the New Testament, that we are to be concerned about those who are orphans and widows. It's unfortunate that 50 uh, years ago, 60 years ago, that passages like this became very controversial among churches of Christ in the sense that some said that this can only be fulfilled on an individual basis, and that it would be wrong for the church out of its contribution to send money to an orphan home or a home for the aged. And uh, brethren actually split over this very issue. And that's a, the sad thing. Now, in recent times, a lot of those splits have been healed. A lot of brethren who uh, some have called anti-brethren or non-institutional brethren have... Uh, been reconciled with those of us who do support orphan homes out of the treasury and uh, boys' homes and things like that. So there, in recent times, there has been a healing of that division among some brethren. But the argument is being made by those brethren who, who say that in verse 27, that this is to be done on an individual basis, that this is not something that can be done collectively as a church. What is the problem with that method? That is a legitimate method to do it on, as an individual Christian. But what is the problem in saying that in verse uh, 27? Acts chapter 6, you see the, the uh, Grecian widows were being neglected and, and uh, they were being taken care of, uh, the Right. 
It was an ongoing, continuous. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so you had uh, that situation dealt with there in the church of Jerusalem, the Grecian widows uh, that were being neglected. And so on a daily basis, they, they solved that issue by choosing, was it seven? Seven, seven. seven men to, to be servants, Stephen being one of them, uh, to, to, to distribute and to help that situation where the apostles could focus on the teaching aspect. And that's later on why you have Elders and deacons. Deacons serve in the uh, serving capacity, whereas deacons, or excuse me, where, whereas elders serve in the more spiritual realm uh, of things within a congregation. <clears throat> but the problem here is this: to say that this can only be done on, a, on an individual basis, James chapter one and verse twenty-seven, is to say that the church as a whole cannot practice pure and undefiled religion. But that's an erroneous conclusion. Can the church, can we as the Royce Christ collectively, can we practice pure and undefiled religion? Well, sure we can. So we can do it collectively and as individuals. So individually as a Christian, I can practice pure and undefiled religion. And collectively as a church, we can practice undefiled religion. So to, to limit verse 27 to the only to the individual Christian in taking care of widows and orphans is to restrict the, the, the verse there, and that is, that is wrong to, to bind that as a, a particular way of doing things or the only way of doing things. Now, if, if brethren who call themselves non-institutional, if they do not want to... Uh, help widows and orphans out of the contribution of the church, they don't have to. But the question is, are they taking care of orphans and widows? If they want to do it all individually, that's fine. But the question is, are they doing what verse 27 says? If they do it individually, great. If we do it collectively, great. Is it getting done? That's the point. So, the problem with antiism as it's sometimes labeled, is the binding of one particular method of doing things and saying this is the only way you can do it when biblically we have the authority of doing it other ways as well that are just as legitimate. Now there are some problems with uh, some orphan homes being overtaken by liberal-minded brethren who are doing things that are contrary to the will of God, and certain places, that, that is a problem. I have no problem seeing that. But that does not make the orphan home unscriptural. The orphan home is a home. That's basically what it is. Yes? John, I mean, it doesn't matter what area it's in. Anytime, anytime that we bind <clears throat> upon our fellow man something which God is not bound, right. we're, we're, we're Pharisees, right? Right. And Right, exactly. That's a very good point because he condemned them. You read that in Matthew chapter 23 and throughout the uh, gospel accounts. He condemned them not for closely obeying the law of Moses, not for that, but to adding to it by, by adding a method of doing things. Like in Matthew chapter 15, they added the method of washing your hands in a certain way and Jesus and his disciples didn't do it. And so they got on to Jesus for not doing it. And then Jesus turned it back on them. Why do you violate the will of God by your traditions? So it's things like that. It, when you bind a certain way of doing things as, as the only right method, that is the problem of antiism. It's not that that method is wrong. It's that you're binding it as the only way of doing it when there's other ways of doing it. That goes to the whole one cup issue among brethren. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
can you start with remaining socially pure or honoring your parents? Or what is there about this one commandment that, or instruction, that makes it a mark of difference? Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, Well, uh, the one reason I would give is because it shows our love for fellow man. Those who are, those who are the, uh, the, 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 the weakest or the most needy among us, especially in that society, was the widows and the orphans. And so to, sh- to show compassion, you, you visit, you see them, those who are in need, and to, to help them in their affliction. That's what he says there, in their affliction. So sh- showing compassion to the orphans and the widows, as we've seen from the law of Moses and we're now seeing from the law of Christ, is a, a characteristic of the true religion of God. They would be most vulnerable within a, a society back then um, because they didn't have all the government programs to help them. Uh, and so uh, that shows uh, uh, compassion and love for your fellow man in, in that regard. That's the best way I know how to answer that. Yes? Very good. Right. That's very good. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, the day of judgment, uh, he depicts this. This is the, the most lengthy discussion on the day of judgment. And, and in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31, the Son of Man comes in His glory with all His holy angels. Then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Notice what he says in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now notice in the things that he says following, he doesn't mention repentance. He doesn't mention baptism. He doesn't mention the Lord's Supper. He doesn't mention worship. Are those things important? Yes. Other passages tell us that. But notice what he's talking about here on the day of judgment. Will we be judged by those other things? Yes, it's part of the will of God. But notice what we find here. Verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? They're they're puzzled about that. Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So there's that compassion that is being shown to others. We're doing it to Christ because it's part of the body. Part of the body. Yes. Exactly. Everything he says over here in Matthew 25. That's, that's, that's a very good point because that falls into what we're looking at here in James 1.27. Loving your neighbor as yourself, loving your fellow man as yourself, the orphans and the widows. Taking care of them, making sure that their, their needs are being met, seeing to it that they are relieved from their affliction. So that is, that is part of our pure and undefiled religion before God. And... That, that is something that needs to be done. The, the problem that I've seen in the controversy over the past 50 years, and I'm not that old, I've read about it, 
the stuff that I've seen as far as a controversy in the debates that so many brethren are bickering over how to do it, then a lot of places it's not getting done. Well, you can bicker and argue and debate on how to do it while the, those are people around us who are in need. And I, I know that there is a right way and a wrong way to do things, but there is also a wrong way of doing things as far as just binding one certain method. And as I was saying before, that's the problem with antiism. It binds one legitimate method and says, this is the only way you can do it. That's the problem with the one-cup brethren who still bind. There are, there are one-cup brethren who don't bind it. Uh, but the one-cup brethren who say, everyone in the church has to drink from one cup or you're not worshiping properly. Uh, that is binding where God has not bound. And that is a making a law where God hasn't made a law. Uh, so that's the problem. Yes, you can drink from one cup, but that's not the only way you can do it. And still worship God properly. So it's, it's a shame that passages like this have become uh, issues of controversy when they really shouldn't. We, we need to, uh, to, to go about doing God's will. I believe that churches of Christ can have unity in which people differ on how to do this as long as it's being done. And that's the point that I want to emphasize. The orphan and the widows need to, to, to be taken care of. Now, there are a lot of brethren who conscientiously will not support an orphan homes, but they are actively involved in adopting children, them, children themselves, and that's great. They have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, activity with that. That's fine. That's one of many ways that th that can be done. Now, look at the second part of verse 27. To keep, one so keep oneself unstained from the world unspotted from the world. That's part of pure and undefiled religion. To visit the widows and orphan in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Throughout the Bible, that's summed up with one word. Starts with an H. Holy. Holy. Be holy, for I am holy. That's what God said to His people in Leviticus over and over and over again. That's a key phrase that you find throughout the book of Leviticus. Peter repeats it in 1 Peter. Be holy, for I am holy. So holiness is keeping oneself unstained or unspotted from the world. Yes. Romans uh, chapter 12 and verse 2. Excellent cross-reference to that. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul talks about our dedication and our devotion to holiness. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. You change the way you think, you're going to change the way you live. And that is keeping oneself unspotted from the world. And there's a story I heard one time that, that really illustrated this, this concept. You know, sometimes uh, we, we, if we're not careful, we can justify things in our mind to the point that we are trying to get as close to the edge or close to the border of holiness and, and, and not cross the border, but get, get as close as we can. And, and that should not be our attitude. Our attitude should be like uh, Joseph, who ran from the situation. How can I do this great evil and sin against my God? And he ran away from Potiphar's wife, got away from it as fast as he could, Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lust. Get away from it, as far away from it. Don't see how close you can get to it without sinning. Uh, there was this um, father whose daughter wanted to go and, to a prom, participate in the prom 
dancing and the things that go on after the prom. And he really didn't want her to go. Didn't want her to participate. But he let her buy this really pretty dress that's really, it was white and it was, it was frilly and beautiful. And he took her down to, uh, on the way to dropping her off, he took her down to an old mine shaft and let her get out and said, I want you to walk around in there, but I want you to keep yourself from getting dirty. I want you to walk around in that old mine, but I want you to keep your dress clean. You know what? She didn't go in. She understood it would be virtually impossible for her to participate in going into a place like that to keep herself clean, that dress clean. We cannot dance with the devil and think it's not going to affect us. We cannot play with the world. We cannot flirt with evil. We cannot flirt with the things of this world and think it does not have uh, an effect on us. And, you know, I find myself, you know, watching TV or watching movies, and I'm very careful. I I don't want my kids watching certain things, but I think to myself, why am I? I'm a Christian. That whole concept of holiness and keeping oneself unstained from the world. So we have to have that attitude of, 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 I don't want to even get close to it. I don't even want to get involved in it. Instead of, how close can I get to it without getting dirty? I mean, we would not, we would not think of, of, of doing something uh, that would be uh, detrimental as far as uh, physically, as, uh, something uh, in a physical realm, as far as getting into an area that might be contaminated with some disease or there might be a contagion in the air, we wouldn't dare go into that place for risk of maybe getting infected. And we need to think about it that in the spiritual realm. Keep oneself unstained, unspotted from the world. That means we are to live closer to the Lord, and the closer we get to the Lord, the purer lives we will live. We will be pure in the eyes of God. Any questions or comments about that? Exactly. And then when you go down to what pure and undefiled religion is, well, this guy thinks he's religious. How are you going to show him that he's not, even if he's not doing this right? That's a very good point. As far as the bridling of the tongue, it goes back to being slow to speak, as he spoke of it earlier. Quick to hear, slow to speak. In verse 19, um, you've got to be willing to be instructed, but if you can't control your tongue... Have you ever been with someone and you can't get a word in edgewise because they're always doing this number right here. They're always, always doing this. And you're trying. And you can't talk. You can't say anything. You can't instruct them because they're always doing this. And you know, book of Proverbs talks about a fool has many words. Over and over again, it talks about how the fool just jabbers, jabbers. You can't talk to a person like that They dominate the conversation and therefore they're not going to get any instruction because they they can't slow down enough to hear anything. Bridle, self-control, the controlling of of one's tongue. And he's going to talk about that more in chapter 3. Okay, chapter 2, verses um, 1 through 7, he's going to talk about... um, well, actually, it's going to go through a chapter, verse 10, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. He talks about the sin of showing partiality. The sin of showing partiality. And I want to uh, go into that, but first I want to look at Acts chapter 10, 
The reason why we should not show partiality is because God does not. Acts chapter 10, when the first Gentiles become Christians. Verse 34 and 35, when Corn- he, Peter goes to Cornelius, and Cornelius said, We're here all present before God to hear all things commanded you of, by God. Peter opened his mouth and says, I, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. God shows no partiality. And in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, in talking about how God will reward the faithful, but He will punish the wicked, He's reminded the Jews... Uh, there in verse 10, but glory and honor, peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For verse 11, there is no partiality with God. God is absolutely, totally fair. He is fair in perfection. No partiality whatsoever. Even when God had a special nation, Israel, in the Old Testament period, there were people outside of Israel that could be right with him. Naaman. Did he not preach, have Jonah go preach to people who were not even Israelites? He had Jonah go preach to the Ninevites. The enemies. The enemies of Israel. But yet he wanted them to be saved. Told them, you go tell them to repent. God shows no partiality, neither should we. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1 of James. My brethren, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If a man wearing gold, a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothes comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not made a distinction among yourself and become judges With evil thoughts? The answer is yes. That is wicked. Whether you show distinction in a person, as he gives the illustration here between the rich and the poor, whether you show distinction between black or white, whether you show distinction in people for for whatever reason, that is sinful. That is wrong. And he gives the illustration here of a man walking in with with gold clothing and fine... um, uh, with gold uh, ring and fine clothing comes into the assembly. It's very interesting. The Greek word in verse 2 for assembly is the word synagogue. It's the only time for assembly in the New Testament in reference to the church that that Greek word for synagogue is used. That has led some to believe that James may have been a very early epistle written. As the usual word for church throughout the New Testament, is uh, uh, ecclesia, the called out. So we have an assembly. A poor man and a rich man comes in. You pay attention to the man that's, that's in the fine clothing. Sit up here, sit with us. Why don't you go out and eat with us after services? He pulls up with a nice car. And someone off the street comes in. And we don't even speak to them. We kind of ignore them. Maybe they'll go away. If we say something to them, they might ask for money. So we won't even acknowledge them. That's sinful. That's wrong. For brethren to do that, to show favoritism to the rich and to to insult the poor is, is something that is wicked. You become judges with evil thoughts. Look at verse 5. He says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which He has promised to those who love Him? Who is it that most often responds to the gospel? The rich or the poor? The poor. Where in the world is the church growing like wildfire? Poor nations. Africa. India. They have baptisms every day. 
over there. Within a year, they'll have one or two or three hundred baptisms in the mission work that's going on over there. And they're poor. That poverty there is conducive for humbleness and a meekness and a willingness to listen and realize the riches that are, that are in Christ. God has chosen the poor and the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. I mean, just look at Jesus. Was he wealthy or was he poor? Anyone that's honest with the scriptures can see Christ was a poor man. He told one disciple at one point, he says, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Talking about the the commitment that was going to be involved, the poverty that would be involved. Now, just because a person is poor doesn't automatically mean they're going to listen to the gospel or that they're going to be a faithful Christian. But riches can be a barrier. Look at what he says in verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the noble name, or excuse me, the honorable name, by which you are called? For the most part, I know there are exceptions, but for the most part, do you not see among the rich and the wealthy a disdain for Christ? Do you not see among the rich and the wealthy of Hollywood a disdain for spiritual things? Uh, they make fun of Christianity. They make, they make fun of spiritual values. Um, they are very open to sin and, and things that are contrary to the will of God, but they're very close to, to people who are uh, of strong faith in what the Bible teaches. So you see here, it's, he's saying it's the rich people in general who are dragging you before the courts, and then it's the people who are blaspheming that noble name by which you are called. Here's the point in verse 8. And we'll stop on this. Verse 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convinced by the law as transgressors. You love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. This is fulfilling the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we're told by Christ and we're taught by Him that any fellow human being is our neighbor. It doesn't matter whether they're American. It doesn't matter whether they speak English. It does not matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter whether they're Republican or Democrat. They're our neighbor and we are to love them as we love ourselves. When we do that, we fulfill the royal law. In the Greek, royal law is one Greek word. And it means a law from the king. But if we show partiality, you're committing sin and con- convicted by the law as transgressors. God shows no partiality. We'll continue our study next week in James. Be reading chapter 2.